It behooves us to glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life, and resurrection, by whom we are saved and delivered. Words taken from the introit of this holy mass. And from the gospel we heard this, Jesus, knowing that his hour was come, that he should pass out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. Words taken from the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. All throughout her life and most especially throughout her campaign to reestablish the French crown, St. Joan of Arc had an abiding love and respect for the priesthood. Although she did not require priestly counsel, she had angels and saints talking to her. Nevertheless, she needed their priestly power to put order in her life and those around her. She went to confession frequently to do this and assisted at Holy Mass daily. She had the priests lead the way to Orléans, chanting hymns and psalms, carrying banners, displaying the cross and passion. It was the priest who led the way to the victory. It was the priest who found her sword, the one left by Shaur Martel. Once when she was going out to fight in haste at Orléans, she pulled back the reins on her steed and said to the priest at a church, please pray the Psalms and make procession so that we will be victorious. She knew where the victory came from. Throughout all her trial, in front of the Burgundians and the English, she was respectful to the priests and the bishops, even as some of them sought to put her to death. St. Joan of Arc. In the time of the Maccabees, upon careful reading of these books of the Holy Bible, we realize it was the priests who ultimately made the final victory possible. It was only through the efforts of Simon the high priest that all the Gentile forces were finally eradicated from the citadel of Jerusalem. These good priests recovered and restored the lost liturgy revealed to Moses on the mountain. They cleansed the temple. They removed the defiled stones to an unclean place and destroyed, destroyed all pagan idols and altars. They restored the order of things that pleased God, and they were blessed. Yet it is no secret, if you read the scriptures carefully, it was also the priests that brought down the temple to begin with. Had they remained faithful, Jerusalem would have remained immovable. At the victory over the Turks at Belgrade in 1456, it was not the great Hungarian general Hunyadi that had won the day but rather an old Capuchin priest, St. Juan Capistrano, carrying the cross given him by the Pope Calixtus III. He led the men into battle, literally right in front, an old priest leading the way and nothing could touch him. It changed the ties to complete victory over the vastly superior Muslim forces. He brought calm and order to the troops and to this general as well. On Malta in 1565, during the greatest siege of all time, it was the presence of the priests that kept the knights of St. John looking up to heaven for help and maintaining interior peace through the sacraments. At the end of the day, it was their presence that made the difference. The dispirited Muslims left on Our Lady's Nativity. September 8th. At Lourdes, Our Lady instructed St. Bernadette to tell the priest to come here in procession. When they came, a steady stream of miracles flowed forth from Lourdes, about half of them from the benediction of the Most Blessed Sacrament. It is the priests that make us or break us. If order is lost in the world, they are inevitably at the bottom of it all. There would be no passion of the Christ if Judas had not betrayed our Lord. He's the only one who could initiate the passion. An ordained minister, a bishop, was the only one who could usher in the passion. No one else could touch our Lord. 
when Jonas flees, what happens? Storms arise. But when he works with God as he's supposed to, what happens? Storms are calmed and conversions happen. So we think about it. If we're going to restore order in this world, make no mistake about it, it can only be done through the priest of Christ. That's it. This is how God has arranged things. The Catholic priest is ordained. That is, he receives the sacrament of holy orders, or sometimes just holy order, we call it. And that means he's placed in the hierarchy of the church, where hierarchy is referring to a sacred ruler, a sacred ordering. In theology, we know that when a priest is ordained, his soul undergoes a change in being, an ontological change, to use technical language. And what it means is this. His soul is reordered in some way. It's reordered to Christ. Such that it is made capable of acting in his person. In the person of Christ the head of the body. In persona Christi Capitis. It's an amazing reality. It's a mystery. Through his priest, Christ the head brings order to his mystical body, order to souls, order to families, order to parishes, order to dioceses, and even the whole world. How does he do this? By way of the cross. That's how he does it. Sacerdos is the Latin word for priest, and it means giver or perhaps doer of sacred things. Giver or doer of sacred things. Sacerdos. The sacred thing the priest gives is access to the cross. That's what he does. And he gives access to all its fruits. And there's no order without the cross. There's no order then without the priest. What is the first and primary heir of Russia? It is this. They refuse to be united to the high priest, the pontiff, the pope. After the fall of Constantinople in 1453, they called Moscow the third Rome. They couldn't resist. It was too juicy to pass up. This very same error spread to England under Henry VIII. And if you study revolution and the disorder that we're laboring under at this time, Many of its roots can be traced to these two countries, Russia and England. Order comes from the priest of Christ making the cross available and revolution or disorder in any community or in the world at large comes from breaking away from the cross, breaking away from the priest, unwilling to cooperate with him, unwilling to work with him. And here is why I make this claim. The cross, as a source of order, is something that has been established from the foundation of the world. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's the first words of the Holy Bible. Surely thereafter, we hear some of what this means on the second day of creation. And God made a firmament and divided the waters that were under the firmament from those that were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. On this day of creation, therefore, God divided the cosmos in a vertical way. That is, what is above from that what is below. On the next day, we hear this. God also said, let the waters that are under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so done. And God called the dry land earth and gathering together of the waters he called seas. So, on this third day of creation, we hear how God divided creation in a horizontal way. Sea from land. Putting the two together, we see the presence of the cross in creation from the very beginning, vertical and horizontal. After this sign of the cross had been made in the beginning, 
It's embedded in the created fabric of the universe. This cross is there in the very beginning. Moses tells us for the first time after the cross has been established, if you read Genesis, and God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. The cross is our heritage. And the scriptures say clearly, it is good. It is the source of order and has been so from the foundation of the world. And this is surely one reason why the priest makes the sign of the cross in the prayers at the foot of the altar when he says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. The priest does nearly everything in the sign of the cross or in the presence of the cross. His stole is in the shape of a cross when he puts it on. The chasuble has crosses on the front and back. He lifts up his hands at mass because of the cross. He wears black to remember that someone special died on a cross. Sometimes the priest is asked, why do you wear black? I always tell him, because somebody died. Somebody special died. That somebody happens to be the Son of God on Good Friday. That's why I wear black. It has to do with the cross. Now, looking toward the end of time, we've established the beginning. What about the end? We go to the end of time, we find these words of His Majesty. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And in another place, He says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and gather together his elect from what? The four winds. From the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. The world, therefore, we understand, will come to an end with the sign of the Son of Man, that is the cross, on display in the heavens. The angels will gather the elect in the sign of the cross from the four points of the compass as well as from the vertical heavens and the horizontal earth. How important it is, how very important it is to be marked with this sacred sign for that day. The cross brings order to all creation. And it is the priest that makes it possible. And it is good. If we look at the middle of time, so we see the cross is at the beginning, we see the cross is at the end. What about the middle? We look at the middle of time. Not surprisingly, we find the cross. It is the wood in the manger and the constraining swaddling clothes, as well as the blood shed by His majesty at His circumcision. But more importantly, we have Calvary, and to which all things point. Thus, His majesty claimed to the Jews, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all things to myself. If I be lifted up. St. John adds, Now this he said, signifying what death he should die. What does the priest do? Why do we have a priest? So that he can represent Calvary, Golgotha. That's why we have a priest. He represents this reality. He makes access to the cross possible. At every holy mass, through the double consecration, We have a separation of body and blood. At the second consecration, the Mysterium Fidei, we are at the cross. His infinite power is available. If you only knew where you were at Mass, you would die. You would die. No wonder then St. John speaks of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world in the Apocalypse. It is the priesthood of Christ, which is of the order of Melchizedek, which is forever, that makes this eternal sacrifice available under the rite of bread and wine. Without the priest, there's no access to the Lamb and His most fruitful cross. So we should say it's very difficult to have access. Now, down through history, it was the cross of Christ that wins the victory from the outstretched hands of Moses, holding the wood staff, and Samson dying in the shape of a cross, to Constantine gaining the victory against Maxentius to usher in Christendom, in hoc signo vinces, in the sign you shall conquer. 
That's how Christendom began. St. Joan of Arc died a victorious death before the cross and so on with all the other Christian victories worthy of note. At the beginning of the world, we find the cross. At the end of the world, we find the cross. At the middle of the world, we find the cross. It brings order to our world. Victory to God and His church. And it is good. And it is the priest who makes access to it Easy and available. Wow. He presents it to us. This is the sign of life, the sign of salvation, the sign of election. Oh, how important it is to love the cross and the priests who bring its power to bear in our life and the world. To bring order and victory out of chaos. Now, in the gospel today, we heard how his majesty loved his disciples to the end. He provided these priests and all their future followers a way to access the cross. Do this and remember of me. As long as you do it, as we heard in the 1 Corinthians, so you will remember me and bring me present until the end, until it's over. But he also put order in the souls of his disciples Not only through priestly ordination, he reordered their souls. But he also gave them teachings as well as example, as is seen in his washing their feet. So the priest, acting as an angel, called by Almighty God, or specially ordained to enlighten the faithful from the pulpit, speaking on behalf of Christ, and shame on him if he does not. That's his job, to enlighten you as an angel enlightens. From the pulpit, he used to be an angel. He enlightens his subjects. He puts order in their minds to dispel the errors of the world by giving them sound teachings and good morals. Having consecrated at the altar the precious blood, he now has the ability to take that precious blood. Almost literally, he has the chalice in his hand and he walks to the confessional. As it were, the wine cellar where order is put into our souls. And when he gives you absolution, he takes that chalice and he dumps that on your soul. That's why it's important to always be sorry for your sins that no sacrilege will take place. We don't want to dump out the precious blood. And that's why sometimes he may work with you to bring out sorrow in your soul. He's trying to put order in your soul. Before he puts in the precious blood to wipe away your sins, the order needs to be there. True sorrow for sin and amendment for life, lest we commit a sacrilege. So in the wine cellar of the confessional, the priest puts charity and order in the souls of his faithful. But he also guides them as a Moses through the desert to the promised land. You know, if you read the book of Exodus and Numbers, many tried to do without Moses. We don't need that Moses anymore. And they failed miserably. It is through the priest that God brings order to the world. As everyone knows, the priesthood has been undergoing a crisis at all levels for some 50 years or so. Not surprisingly, the loss of proper order in the world is also showing. We're feeling it. Often we hear error from pulpits. We see disorder in parishes. It's hard. This reality is on display in the third secret of Fatima for those who have eyes to see. In describing things before the cross appears, remember she describes some things and then right in the middle the cross appears. She says there's this cross. What happens before that cross appears? Sister Lucia saw the situation as displaying some confusion. A bishop in white appears to be the Holy Father, but she is not certain because he's not pursuing the cross. He's not seeking to instill order in the world. He's not acting like the popes and high priests of old. Meanwhile, some bishops, priests, and religious are trying to seek, it seems, the cross by climbing a mountain, but it's not certain what that mountain is. She doesn't describe it as having the cross on top. But no laymen are following. It is a confusing scene. But once the cross appears, something happens. 
Once the cross appears at the top of the mountain, suddenly everything changes. The Holy Father is seen climbing up to the summit with bishops, priests, religious, and lay faithful of various ranks climbing up after him in due order and dying for the love of God. They are now ordered. The cross has put order in the world. Their blood is made precious and effective for the conversion of sinners. Angels will not let even a drop of it be lost. Heaven is opened anew, total restoration and the promised triumph of Mary's immaculate heart are soon to come. They're hinted at. The worldly then sense the lost ordering that we're experiencing and are working to establish a new order without the cross. Thus, they need to replace our priests and they're doing it. As a result, we see the rise of various replacements. Among them, we can name some. This is my job as a priest to enlighten you as to the evil that is upon us. It may make some squirm, may make some laugh. I don't know. But among them are the so-called superheroes. Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, and so on. Their origin is traceable to none other than 1917 to some Russian exiles who are not Catholic or Christian. Anyone surprised? Notice how their popularity has been growing. Movies are made. People are wearing their shirts and playing these games and having videos and watching the DVDs. And isn't this a good movie? Is that so? Why are they looking at them? Because order is being shown in them. Look how ordered they are. Look how they're helping people. The new priests, the new order, without God and without the cross. By the way, secular Christmas songs came about at almost the exact same time. Let it snow, let it snow. Frosty the Snowman, Winter Wonderland. These came at almost the exact same time. No cross needed, no priests. Let us be sure not to support these efforts in any way. Throw out that stuff. Be done with that false, fake Christ. Now, it's been noted how young men also, who at first feel called to be a priest, later decide to enter the military instead. Fellow priests have noted this over and over. These young men, when they're young, I want to be a priest. But before long, when they get older, they don't become priests. They go to the military instead. Why so? What's going on there? What happened to their vocation? Well, this makes sense, too, when we realize that what they really want is order and to help bring order to our world. The current lack of order in the priesthood or the lack of ability of good priests to bring order into a community has some young men despairing of this vocation. What's the use? You can't do anything as a priest now anyway. I tell you, this is a mistake. It is like Jonas running from the Lord. The storm will only increase in ferocity, until such ones willingly become another Christ and get in touch with the victim priest and his cross. We all feel the lack of order in the world increasing. The answer is not to flee from the cross, but to embrace it. The answer is to cooperate as much as possible with our good priests, the ones that are seeking to work within the boundaries of their calling to bring forth order into souls, families, parishes. And we should be loath, loath to have anything to do with anybody who resists a priest working within his legitimate boundaries to guide his people to the promised land. To do so is to work against God, is to work against order. I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how right they may be. God always supports his priest. Order comes through the priest. So when we embrace this cross, God will work. The cross will save us. Charity will be ordered within us. The priest brings God's order to the world. Order that was established at the very beginning in the shape of the cross and will be completely victorious at the end with the same cross. We cannot do without this cross. We cannot do without the priest who gives us easy and ready access to it.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.